Okay, everybody. Good afternoon. I'm Yossi Sheffi. I'm the director of the Center for Transportation Logistics. If you don't know who I am, you don't belong here. And that's it. <laughs> anyway, uh, this is in fact the, uh, this event is the event that opens our celebration for the 50th anniversary of the Center for Transportation Logistics at MIT. The center was founded in uh, 1973, which is an interesting year because it's the first year that FedEx started operation. April 1973, FedEx started the uh, uh, start operation with a few Falcon airplanes that don't have the same capacity as today's 777 that they're using. It's a very small, what you might call executive, uh, executive plane. Today, however, the company has of seven, close to 700 uh, airplanes, does about close to $100 billion a year, does uh, over 16 million packages a day. But anyway, on the first day, they ran 128 packages. Uh, a little growth since, since then. Um, I'm very, very excited to have uh, Fred Smith here. Uh, people in this crowd know Fred is a legend in our field because the person did not only start a company, he changed everything in transportation, in logistics. He started an industry, more than a company. Everything, some of you think that there was always the case that you could get, you know, a package next day. Most of the people here think that this is the case. It's not. There was nothing like this before. There was nothing like absolutely positively had to be there by 10.30 the next morning. It was all news to everybody. Tracking a package? Who even thought about tracking packages? The number of firsts that uh, FedEx has done is just things that we all take for granted today. They're, of course, working on the next level, the next uh, set of, uh, uh, of innovations, which some of it we hope to, uh, to hear about today. But please join me in welcoming Fred Smith to MIT. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll start with, with some some questions about the, about the innovations. The last, you know, we are looking at the last 50 years, the next, maybe not 50 years, but a few years. Um, I mentioned some of the past innovation. Could you talk to us about is, what is FedEx working on today? What are the innovations that uh, the company is engaging? Yeah. Well, I'll be glad to. Um uh, glad to do so. First, let me uh, express again my appreciation for you having me up here. Uh, at my age, and, and uh, I, I have a fairly strict criteria on when I accept uh, trips and, and visits and speaking engagement. One, that it's uh, strategically important for FedEx. Two, that it can get FedEx a lot of additional business. Or three, I get asked, uh, by someone who I can't say no to that I have such respect for. So I'm here because all three of those boxes were checked when uh, Yossi sent me the request to come up here. This is one of the great institutions and certainly the leader in the logistics field. So I, I believe you sent me the note and I probably replied either that day or the next day. Absolutely, the, the same day reply. Well, um, as, as uh, the professor said, we, we've had a lot of innovations at FedEx over the years. Uh, the reason is pretty simple. If you're in business and you don't innovate, uh, you're in the process of commoditization or extinction. So um, we invented package tracking, as you probably know. Prior to the FedEx package tracking capability, uh, that was uh, not possible in supply chains. You just put something in and hope it came out the other end someplace, sometime. And uh, to do that, we had to, to invent all kinds of things, like a, a numerically sequential multi-part uh, air bill, uh, 
Uh, there had been barcodes, you know, that said, I'm a can of tomato soup, but nobody had ever made a five-part air bill that had a number that said, I'm one, two, three, four, five, and then stick it on the package. And then we tried to have a little device that could read it. Started off as about the size of a bread box. That didn't really, uh, then we worked and worked. We got it down to about the size of my glasses here. And then we had a data link into the, into the truck in one thing or another. And before you knew it, we could, we could track a package. And why that was so uh, profound in the logistics world, as all of you know, because you're uh, students of it or knowledgeable of it, a warehouse has really no value added. It's a place to put something so you know you got it in the simplest terms. And uh, once we were able to, to track it, uh, then you could basically have the equivalent of a warehouse in motion. It didn't make any difference whether it was in a FedEx plane going 500 miles an hour, a FedEx truck going 50 miles an hour, you knew where your inventory was. And that became increasingly important for mission critical type items that were being generated by this rapidly automating society. Uh, then in the 90s, uh, we were really the first practical uh, use of the internet for tracking packages. And uh, I had a CIO at the time, and he had just been up at the University of Illinois and met Mark Andreessen and said, they're doing the damnedest thing up there with this mosaic thing. And one of my old partners had gone out to take over Netscape, uh, Jim Barksdale, who, oh, sure. who's such a wonderful guy. He came back on the FedEx board later on. And uh, we had been buying, goodness gracious, I don't know how many PCs to give to our big customers to put in their shipping rooms. I mean, it would have broken us. And then the internet came along and saved us, right? So we could just send the information out. So there are a lot of other ones in, in, in between, but those are just a couple I thought you would relate to. Now, today, I think uh, the most important thing that we have underway in, in terms of innovation are in the following areas. First and probably most important is AIML. We established several years ago uh, a unit called FedEx Data Work. And I believe, and, and we'll see here in the next, uh, next couple of years, that our capabilities in that regard are going to change enormously how we operate and give great value to our customers. And we now have uh, customers who are essentially buying just our digital services, not, not our transportation services. Oh. It's, it's nascent, but it's going to be a very big deal. The second is uh, what would be commonly called Internet of Things. And uh, we developed a proprietary technology called SenseAware. It's uh, Bluetooth. Uh, that you put on a package and uh, you could, if you had it in this room, if every one of you had a sense of wear on it uh, and we had a little reader up in the top of this room, we could go get any one of you individually. It's RFID is very useful too, but marrying that uh, sense of wear, Bluetooth and the RFID, I think you'll go to the next step of custodial control, but even more importantly in supply chains, you'll be able, since we can find which one of these things is you, we'll be able to intervene and uh, you know solve problems on the fly. We delivered about half of the, the vaccines, uh, you know, that uh, we're very proud of, and uh, UPS, the other half. Each one of those vaccine boxes had a sensorware device on it. So with our nascent AI ML, we've come a long way in the last couple of years on that, we could predict the problems. In fact, the first uh, vaccine delivery was here in Boston, by the way. It was from Grand Rapids to a hospital here. And so we would know, based on our predictive analytics, that there was going to be a snow problem in Boston, and we'd, get in, uh, we'd send a note to the hospital. So we may be two, two hours late, but it's only because of the snow. We're on the, on the way. So I think AI ML and uh, internet of, of things. And then in transportation logistics in particular, I think robotics are going to be a bigger and bigger deal. And we have lots of initiatives in terms of loading, unloading trucks. Most of our facilities are already automated. It's the loading and the unloading of the truck that are the big deal. And, and I, I think 
despite the recent uh, skepticism about all the money that's been put into autonomous vehicles, the one area where it will be very successful is over the road uh, transport. And I think that's on the horizon. So those are just a few areas of innovation that, that we're working on. There, there may be some others that will come to me, and I'll mention them later, perhaps. Thank you. Um, let me ask one more question that uh, many of the questions were uh, got from uh, students and, and faculty. Um, your competitors, direct competitors, are UPS, DHL, USPS, and now Amazon. Mm -hmm. How do you look at Amazon as a competitor? Well, uh, this is a fairly long-winded answer, so I'll try to uh, net it down. I gave the long-winded version of this with your team, yes. and I hope that gave you some insight into it. We don't look at Amazon as a direct competitor. We run networks, and all of you who know how networks exist, they, you have to have switches or hubs. Uh, and our systems, uh, FedEx Express has 15 global hubs. Uh, I, I can't even bring it to mind. You know, 1,500 uh, stations. FedEx Ground has uh, almost 50 ginormous hubs and, and uh, another 100 regional hubs and another 500 facilities. FedEx Freight is the biggest LTL carrier in the, in the country. I think it has something like uh, 60 hubs, 370 uh, operating centers. So if you want to put something through the FedEx system, as we did the vaccines, we can pick up at any place virtually in the world, and we can move it through that network or networks and deliver it to any address in the world. That's what we do. We're a system of networks. And if you're interested in that, go on FedEx's uh, investor, FedEx.com, go to investors, a little 22-minute uh, video I did in June 29th that talks about these networks. So uh, Amazon does not have any such networks. Amazon didn't deliver any vaccines. It wasn't because vaccines not a one, I mean, Amazon is not a wonderful company. They just simply don't have networks to do it. The only real peer competitor to us is UPS. DHL is very strong overseas, but they're not strong in the United States. And the Postal Service is involved in the package business, but generally for very lightweight stuff that goes along with the mail. There's, there's, there are exceptions to that, which is hard for them to deal with, but they, they, they still promote it or try to get more of that business. I think that's going to be a real challenge. But to Amazon itself, Amazon is a retailer. And at the end of the day, their major competitor is not FedEx. Their major competitor is Walmart, Target, Home Depot, Lowe's, Dick's Sporting Goods, Best Buy, whatever you want. And their delivery and transport systems, including their airplanes, are not systems like I just described that FedEx or UPS have. They are designed to move, in the case of the airplane, slow-moving inventory that is held in a small number of distribution centers and move them cross country so that you can get them in two business days, which is how they sort of brought people into the e-commerce universe to begin with. So I gave the example with the, with the, the team that we were just talking to that you matriculate out to the West Coast and you have to have some MIT coasters for your bar or some Stanford graduate just has to have some for their bar here in Boston. So there are no Stanford coasters in Boston, I would be willing to bet. There's no inventory <laughs> of them. And vice versa for MIT coasters in the Bay Area. So what Amazon does is they just keep the coasters near the, the campus store of MIT and the campus store of, of, of Stanford, and then you order one, and they fly it across the country, and they deliver it to you in two business days. Their whole system is designed around that, not a series of hub and spokes, and it operates in a completely different circadian or, or cycle than, than we do. They also do their local delivery, and then they use the postal service, and about 12% of UPS's revenue comes from Amazon. We, on the other side of the coin, are allied directly with Target, Walmart, uh, Best Buy, Lowe's, uh, Dick's Sporting Goods, the ones I just mentioned to you. My guess is, I don't know this 
factually, but I'm directionally right. My guess is we do 80 to 90% of all their deliveries. And their e-commerce and efforts over the last few years are mostly delivering high turn SKUs from their stores. So it's a very short delivery as opposed to the much longer delivery of, of Amazon. So Amazon decided to, to vertically integrate and they do, I think I'm right on this, about 70% of all their B2C deliveries to your home and use the postal service and UPS and to some degree, some of these smaller regional carriers. So we don't, we have a lot of respect for Amazon, uh, but we don't look at them as a peer competitor and I'm sure they don't look at us as a peer competitor because they're essentially a retailer who makes the vast majority of their money from selling you things and taking a margin on that, and they don't have network that sell things from every point to every point the way we do. So. Thank you, Fred. Let me change a little bit from talking about FedEx. You are one of the prominent business leaders in the United States, in the world. Uh, looking back, say, 20 years ago, what you find most surprising about the industry today as opposed to 20, 30 years ago? The about next, the industry today? The, the supply chain just management, logistics, yeah. transportation, yeah. because then I'll ask you, what are you, you most optimistic about the next few years? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the, the, the biggest change in the last 20 years, and one that is an enormous personal disappointment to me, is the, the, the China situation. Uh, we've been in China a long time. I was the chairman of the U.S.-China Business Council that pushed very hard for them to get into the, the WTO to get most favored nation status. And shortly after that, uh, it was clear that they were going to not be quite as market-oriented as we had hoped and a lot of other people had, and that they were going to go down more of a state-directed uh, mercantilist path. Uh, in fact, uh, after having performed the, the duties as chairman of the China Business Council, it was sort of ironic that one of the first things they did in that regard was to pass a law which was specifically injurious to FedEx. <laughs> and it, it basically was in contravention of what they had agreed to in the WTO. It, it, it for all intents and purposes, saved a slice of the logistics chain for Chinese indigenous carriers inside China. I think it was like three pounds and below or something. Well, that wasn't permitted under the WTO. Postal monopolies were, but not, not packages. So they changed the law. They took us out from the, um, uh, the transportation ministry and put us under the postal ministry, which is, you talk about a fox garden, a hen house. I was like a <laughs> lion garden, a butcher shop. You know? <laughs> So, so we had to go, go through a big fight. Uh, you can read about it in Hillary Clinton's book when she was Secretary of State. President Bush talked to him about it, President Obama. So eventually, they gave us the licenses for domestic transportation. But after seeing the, the sort of uh, bloodbath that was going on in the domestic market, we have a domestic capability in China, but it's really related to the multinationals and the B2B space. And we sort of have an alliance with the China Post. We're the biggest transporter by air of things to and from China. And in fact, we have an enormous hub in Guangzhou where we take third country stuff through China and move it one to the other. So we have this legacy position in, in China. I mentioned to you that Zhang Zemin actually hosted the FedEx board in his office in 1997. You couldn't get an American or European company in Xi Jinping's <laughs> office if, if for all the tea in China. And by the way, Zhang Zemin loved Elvis, and he had a great voice, and he loved to sing Elvis songs. <laughs> um, I introduced him at the Waldorf and said that to everybody, and, and they were sort of looking skeptical to which then Zhang Zemin piped out <laughs> Elvis songs. Yeah, he had a great voice. <laughs> So at any rate, from those times, the WTO in 2000 and then the, the, the postal th uh, thing, and we had the great financial crisis. And after that, the position of China changed greatly. I mean, they were overtly mercantilist after that. They announced a number of things where they were going to 
to use the power of the state, and then as time has gone on, it's become more and more uh, the case. And so now you've had uh, the United States, both with Trump and Biden, push away from TPP, which we strongly advocated because it was useful as a counterpoint uh, to the rise of mercantilism in, in, in China. So it's been very disappointing, and I, I think that it has become, as you well know, you'll see the workshop of the world, the manufacturing place of the world. So to see all of those things uh, now being into question and people talking about reshoring and, you know, what can we do to, to diversify away from China and all of the sort of things that have come from that, the CHIPS Act, the uh, U.S. mercantilism now to, uh, to fund uh, our chip industry here and the Europeans and all of the embargoed commodities in and, uh, you know, and out of China and the Taiwan uh, rhetoric. Now, maybe it's foolish of me to say this and hope springs eternal. As most of the people who follow this know, uh, there's been a big change here just in the last few months. Uh, Hugh Lee over at Davos said, we're open for business. We're not well, going to we'll stop see. you. But that's a big change. But I think that there's too much water under the dam now with people looking at alternative supply chains and, and so forth, which I know many of you are studying and very, very familiar with. So that's got to be the biggest thing. I mean, it's, it's, it's rare that you have an economy that is not a participant in the world economy and market economy with one point some odd billion people, they come in, and then all of a sudden, they, they change the game. That's got to me to be the biggest thing in the last 20 years. Building in on this, so how do you see globalization in general developing? Look, it is clear when you studied the 20, 30, last, uh, 40 last year of globalization, you know, brought more people out of poverty. Yes. And increased standard of living around the Especially world. Especially in China. By hundreds of millions. Hundreds of millions. And, and, and around the world. Yes. We're moving away from this. Are we? Well, where, where are we heading here? You know, uh, if you look at the history of trade, obviously the mercantilists or the protectionists have been ascendant at some point in time. In the United States, that's sort of fueled by the populist. You know, my job went to China. Certainly some of that's true. But the United States has neither the culture nor the wage uh, expectations that would permit us to really make a lot of T-shirts here or toys or most of the furniture. Uh, a lot more jobs have been lost here because of automation than because of China, but it became, you know, the political uh, theme that really was the biggest thing in Trump's ascendancy. And now that it is such a big deal, the left on the other side organized laborers against free trade, but uh, these things ha happen episodially. And I think the, the benefits of trade are so clear over so many years. Uh, you got to remember, you know, uh, it was Roosevelt and Hull, a Democrat, Cordell Hull, the Secretary of State, who passed the, the Trade Act of 1934 because it was clear by that point that a very big part of the depression that had consumed America and most of the world was because Smoot of Holly. protectionism, the Smoot-Hawley Act, who were two Republicans, by the way, people forget. <laughs> so, so Hull spent the rest of his life, and particularly after World War II, trying to push for the UN, the IMF, the World Bank, and he tried to get a, a global trading organization then. It was too tough. And so they had nine rounds of what they call GATT, General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs. We opened up our markets. A lot of them were, a lot of our rationale was to get preferences and help Germany and Japan, who became allies against the Cold War enemies of Russia and the Communist China. So by the time, you know, the period we're talking about, by, you know, the financial crisis, Every American family was benefiting someplace to the tune of almost $12,000 with higher standard of living because of lower, lower cost imports. And if you think protectionism works, then go to Brazil. I mean, <laughs> as uh, Clemenceau or somebody famously said in the early part of the 20th century, Brazil is the country of the future, and it always will be. And, <laughs> and, and we have a big operation in Brazil, and we love Brazil. And, 
their airplane manufacturer, Embraer, is world class, but they are protectionist. And because of that, they continue to have a hard time lifting people out of poverty. But the politics of the place, particularly now going back to the left with Lula, it's going to be hard for them to, to embrace any kind of open trade. So uh, we at FedEx and me personally are going to, to the extent we can, continue to, to push the benefits and point out the absurdity of some of the protectionists. And my favorite protectionist story came apocryphally, perhaps, uh, from the famous French uh, economist Frederick Bastiat in the 1830s. And they had the same problem then. They said, we want to be exporters. We want to sell a lot of stuff and employ all these French people. We got to sell a lot of stuff overseas. Well, how do you pay for them? And are you willing to buy something? That, no, we're not willing to do that. So he came up with a very funny, satirical little uh, suggestion that they were going to go. He recommended France go into the shipbuilding business, build every damn ship that they could possibly build, take all the goods that they manufactured, put them on the ship, sail them out 20 miles, and sink them. You got perfect situation. <laughs> you know, the exports were manifold, and you didn't have to worry about these pesky imports that came from people you didn't like. Well, of course, it's, it, that's nuts. So, so to get to your point, I think this thing ebbs and flows, but at the end of the day, particularly with today's telecommunications and transportation, the earliest histories of humankind show that there's an innate desire to travel and trade. I mean, the, the amphoras on the bottom of the Mediterranean, the, the Silk yeah. Route, the Marco Polo, they, that's, all, that's what they were doing. So I, I think at uh, a certain point in time, uh, maybe some of the stuff is coming from Vietnam or Colombia or wherever the case may be, but I believe that the, there's, there's just too much impetus that globalization will go back to pre-Smoot Hawley. I hope it will well, happen soon. Well, I hope so soon. too. <laughs> I'm sure. Changing tact again, uh, FedEx invests a lot in sustainability. Yes. And uh, by and large, we think about sustainability as a topic that everybody's interested, everybody agrees upon, until they have to pay for it. Yeah. Then, then it kind of dies down. Where, do we, where are we going there? Well, fortunately in FedEx, we've got a fairly easy uh, decision uh, path on that because we are so energy intensive. I mean, you use fossil fuels to, to fly our 700 planes and 200,000 trucks, although we are a heavy adopter of electric pickup and delivery vehicles, particularly the new Bright Drop EV600, which we helped in some respects for General Motors' bright drop division to, to design it. That's sort of the sweet spot of a battery technology. I mean, sure. cars don't really match up without the subsidies and the Tesla semi notwithstanding, they haven't gotten battery semi trucks, but pickup and delivery vehicles, it is really very accretive, lower cost, you, you can make the case for them. So we've made the commitment to uh, go all electric, I think by 2035 in our pickup and delivery vans. And in California, we have hundreds of these bright dops. I'm gonna go see one week after next, uh, one of our stations out there. In our planes, um, the, they're, you know, they burn a lot of fuel. And so we have good positive ROI in that. And we're doing all the other things that everybody else is. We have long supported and advocated for a carbon tax. Uh, we believe that uh, Professor Nordhaus of Yale, my alma mater, was correct, that that's the way to solve the problem. There's been no political will to do that. Then you've got price and the market allocating these sorts of things. So, uh, you know, I agree with you. Everybody says, well, buy American, buy American, and Walmart's tried this over and over again. They say, all right, here's a buy American T-shirt. It's $12.50. Here's, here's another T-shirt for 950, you know, the 1250s stay on the shelf, the 950, <laughs> and the market rules. And, and there are some examples to the contrary. We are, we have a, we were talking about it a minute ago, we have a carbon calculator. So we're gonna be able to show and tell people, hey, if you need this overnight, this is the carbon it takes. If you'll give us uh, three days to deliver it, this is the carbon it takes. So we're gonna see. 
and uh, we'll share that with you, of course, that because if consumers are really that concerned about it, but um, it, it, I'm not sure that that, that 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 is the case. We also funded a very large endeavor uh, at the Yale School of the Environment run by just an incredibly abled uh, Dean Ingrid uh, Burke, uh, Dr. Uh, Andy Burke, and uh, she and her multidisciplinary scientists are trying to use geological um, forces and, and capabilities to naturally sequester carbon to offset all aviation carbon. So we gave them quite a little bit of money over five years. Boeing has come in with us in Southwest. If you're interested in it, you can uh, bring it up, uh, the Yale Center for Natural Carbon Capture. So we're doing all kinds of things, and we're doing it for pure economics, but even if it weren't pure economics, our customers won't do business with us if they don't think we're re environmentally responsible. That's clear as a bell, it's, it, particularly the young folks. So I do think that the success the United States has had over the last few years, which has been profound, our carbon uh, emissions have almost flat. China's going through the roof. India India's looks like a, uh, you know, an off ramp on a jump jet carrier. So we're we're actually making a lot of progress in the United States. But whether you can get the rest of the world, which are much bigger pollutants than we are today, as Al Gore wants them to do, I'm, I'm dubious about that. Yeah. Um, Maybe last question before I turn, promised uh, we'll have a Q&A with the audience. Okay. But uh, people were interested in how do you measure the value created, the value creation in supply chain? What kind of metric you use? What kind of financial metrics? What kind of other metrics? Uh, asset turns over revenue growth, whatever. What is this that... For, for what? I didn't hear the question. For the supply chain. You have, oh, you have part of the, the supply chain. I'm not talking about the air pipe or, or, or the transportation side. How do you measure the value creation in supply chain? You know, I, I think we're so much more of a provider. We're probably not as expert in that as some of your other customers are. You know, we have a supply chain unit uh, that does third-party logistics. We have a solutions group that goes in at no charge and helps people put the least cost or the least carbon or the fastest, whatever their metrics are. Okay. And they vary by industry, uh, you know, what it is. I mean, if you're in semiconductors, that the huge values per pound, that's one thing. If you're taking defibrillators to Mayo Clinic or Johns Hopkins, that's something else. If you're moving Band-Aids for CVS and, and Walgreens. So we have a very expert group, our solutions group, that helps people design what we hope are their most um, efficient supply chains based on the metrics that they give us. Oh, and see. so that's, that's kind of how we do it. We don't go in and try to sell people who need Volkswagen's Cadillac because we've got such a broad product or service portfolio, uh, we really don't care. I mean, it's, we, it's, we, it's we'll do what customer. you need and we'll help you depending on what you need to do for the for the particular product, we can help you do it. We also, as I said, we have a relatively small supply chain group that manages warehouses and so forth, but it's not nearly as big as DHLs and um, uh, what's the new uh, company that spun off of XPO? What is it? Okay, yeah. So and, and the, both of those are huge. I think those are the two two biggest. But um, but we do. Uh, sort of supply chain design, which is agnostic to any conclusion that we might have going in, but driven by the customer's requirements, but uh, using our expertise and information to help them. Okay, guys, I promised people to give enough time okay. to, ask, to ask questions. We have two microphones here and there. If you want to ask a question, just stand behind the microphone. Just go stand behind the microphone and uh, can ask a question. Or if you really sit in the middle, just wave your hand and nothing will happen. <laughs> I know. Um, By the way, you know what we have for this, talking about an innovation, what we have for sessions like this? 
We have a little uh, padded cube with a mic in it. You know how you do the the in the football stadium? You sure, sure, sure. You go there. Yeah, we got a little cube, and they can just throw them around. <laughs> it's okay. kind of fun. I'll send you one. You can use it. Get it. Absolutely. <laughs> Guys, there's some question here. Would you just tell us who you are before you... Okay, uh, so I'm Matthias from the SEM program, and I've got one question. You told us that you started to innovate with tracking, and you said you continue with active technology with robotics. Um, how did you keep that mindset over the last 50 years to continuously innovate, bring up new ideas, and drive business and stay the front runner? So give me a short version. I, he knows this, but my hearing is very bad no, from I, my I, service days. Yes, I, I, I did not get it. So that's can, so, <laughs> can somebody, can somebody, can somebody give us a Chris? How about huh? Jim? Oh, the mindset. The mindset to, yeah. to, to keep innovating. Yeah, that's that, that, that's a that's a very profound uh, question. I mean, the way you have to do it is to do it. I mean. <laughs> the, 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 the first thing is, I think, <laughs> above all else, is you got to be able to tolerate characters. I mean, a lot of the people come up with really good ideas are, you know, a little strange in certain ways. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's what people thought about me in many different ways. <laughs> so the first thing, great ideas come from strange places, and so you've got to tolerate you know, people that doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, you know, hit, hit the cookie cutter uh, <laughs> mind of a scientist or somebody, you know, so that's the first thing is you got to encourage it and, and accept it from wh wherever it's coming. The second is you got to tolerate failure. You, you, you know, the first time you have a really nifty idea and it doesn't work and you, you know, you're not going to get the second idea or the second project. So the second thing is be able to to tolerate failure. I mean, you know, reasonable risk. You don't want to bet the enterprise, but You've got to put something into uh, into uh, R and D or, or trying to change things. Uh, the people that that uh, developed the package tracking business kind of look like the crowd in the the bar at, in the Star Wars movie. You know, they're an incredible <laughs> group of people. I just love them to death that they just did what they did. And our AIML group today, there are some real characters in there, <laughs> and. Uh, they don't look like me with a blazer and a tie. Tell you that <laughs> so that's the second thing. You got to be willing to, you know, not everything's going to work, and don't kill everybody if it if it doesn't work. So so find the bright lights. Don't have any preconceived notions of who they are, and tolerate idiosyncrasy, and and be willing to accept failure. And I think the third thing is just to pound your fist constantly that the failure to change is commoditization at best and more probably extinction. I mean, one of the things I'm most proud about, I, I, I remember all these companies that have come and gone over the history of, of FedEx. Now, a lot of them are technological, so it's probably not fair for me to do this, but Sun Microsystems, I mean, they changed the world, and Wang, and DEC, and I could just keep going on and on and on. They've all come and gone, but here we are, you know, we're still standing. Not every year is great. We make some mistakes, one thing or another. But somehow we got from that 189 packages to $100 billion because we're very analytical and we do understand you have to change and to change means, particularly in this day and time, to innovate. And to innovate in this day and time, it means adoption of, of uh, leading edge technology. So you just got to work it all the time. All the time. Let Hi. me let me say one other thing. I, I, it'll probably maybe surprise you. I get emails from nuts all the time. <laughs> you know, and and most people in my position, it's like send this to the nut yes. response unit. Mm -hmm. I always I always reply to them. You know, I mean, if they're even um, remotely the credible, because I want to see maybe that's that person that's got that one breakthrough idea. So you just have to work it constantly. Hello, am I audible? Yeah. Go ahead. My name is Anukriti. I'm actually an ex-FedEx employee. I'm from the Luxembourg Center. 
my question is about revenue quality and pricing power in terms of global recession. So we are seeing global recession coming in and we've been hearing FedEx talk about revenue quality and maintaining that pricing power. How, what are the measures that FedEx is taking to do that when, it, when global recession is hitting us? So I got about half of that. Can you give me the recap? I got one third. So Jim, Chris. I can, I can shorten it and repeat it. What did she say? What, 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 now tell, tell it to me again, just briefly. Just this, the My Cliff question is about revenue quality in, when faced with global recession. What is FedEx doing to maintain the revenue quality when faced with glo global recession? How are you handling the recession? Oh, the recession. Oh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you. Well, <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, it's, a, it's an excellent question. And you said you're a FedEx team member, right? Yeah. Thanks for keeping the purple promise. You know, we appreciate it. It takes every one of us every day. Well, the first thing, uh, the way we're handling the recession is the way we've always handled uh, every uh, downturn. We have a lot of what I call shock absorbers built in in our cost structure. Uh, our uh, annual incentive compensation, our long-term employment. So the first people that, that get it on the chin when the volumes start going down are the management, particularly the top management. Second, we design our network so we always have a fair amount of equipment that is written off the books, that, but we can use it on the upside, but we can, we can put it in the trash on the, on the downside. And the third thing that we have is every year we, we have what's called uh, uh, staffing effectiveness. And each one of our units is supposed to look at how they're organized and see if what they're doing uh, in every uh, area is adding value to the enterprise. If it's not, we got to stop doing it. And that means that we have to get reassign people, become more efficient and so forth. Now, we don't have the same challenges that a lot of the tech companies that, that do, but there is definitely a slowdown in global trade, which is affecting our express unit. But our freight and ground units are doing exceptionally well. So we'll be, we've already done it, taking down flights across the Atlantic, taking flights down across the Pacific, uh, going through staffing effectiveness, the usual suspects, as you would say. But I think that our uh, issues are so relatively small relative to other people, we'll actually come out on the other side, which has been true in most of these downturns stronger. But we're doing all of those things today. Matthias, go ahead. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. So yeah, I'm Matthias. We just met in the staff meeting earlier, and I was surprised by your answer when you were asked about the role of Amazon that you said, you don't really see Amazon as a direct competitor. And I understand that from today's point of view, but given what you said about innovation, that you see the strongest frontiers of innovation to be ML and AI, robotics and the like, on all of these fronts, Amazon is one of the front runners with probably the deepest pockets in the industry. And um, I'm wondering, we've seen them become last mile delivery agents. We've seen them start an airline. What would keep them? from replicating the hub-and-spoke model that, for instance, FedEx is running? $150 billion. <laughs> <laughs> so, so <laughs> if you go to Paris, which is our biggest hub in Europe, we're the largest operator in Paris after Air France. You couldn't duplicate that hub in Paris for all the tea in China. I mean, it wouldn't have any difference how much money you have. Uh, we bought uh, TNT, which has been a very difficult acquisition in part because right after we bought it, Putin fired a cyber weapon at Ukraine and, and brought the company to its knees along with a lot of others like Merck and Maersk and uh, the, the healthcare. So Amazon is capable of doing what Amazon wants to do because they're a prodigious company with a lot of cash flow. But at the end of the day, the purpose of a corporation is to, to, to return something for its shareholders. So the moat around FedEx and UPS in terms of these networks 
make it a fool's errand to do that. I mean, why would you, I mean, it's, they're just, it makes no sense. So if they wanted to do it, quite frankly, I think they would have made an acquisition in that space, not where they get a lot of the things that we have. So I'll just leave it at that. They're, they're a wonderful company. Their e-commerce business did not make money in the first, second, third quarters. We'll see how they did in the fourth quarter. Their AWS is the business. So if I were running Amazon, I'd want to know what more I can do on the business that's making a ton of money rather than trying to, you know, figure out how to lose more money. Because, <laughs> and, and by the way, I have a son who's a football coach and I talk to him all the time. The main thing he does is he scouts himself and he scouts the, he scouts the opponent, right? So we scout ourselves and we scout our opponents. So I'm not whistling past the graveyard. I, I mean, I understand exactly what, what Amazon can do. And again, have the greatest respect, but they don't have networks like we do and we're not a retailer like they are. So could they come over and become, you know, DHL three? Of course they could, just like General Motors could if they wanted to, or Microsoft could. But the fact that they fly airplanes doesn't mean that they're doing what we're doing. Or the fact that we fly airplanes doesn't mean that we're doing what, this has been the, one of the biggest misunderstandings for years, because from 2016 forward, Business Week put this cover thing on and said, oh, here comes Amazon. It was written by a guy that had done a, uh, what would you call it, a popular history of the Postal Service. The biggest contract in the history of the United States Postal Service, you know what it was? It was with us. It wasn't mentioned in the book. <laughs> so, I mean, when you have such top of the wave journalism as that, they sure as hell didn't understand anything about what they were talking about, about Amazon and us. So you have to understand these things at the granular level and then the network thing. So again, they're a great company, a fantastic retailer, made the e-commerce e business. They're allied with UPS. We're allied with Walmart, Target, Home Depot, Lowe's, and so forth. So that's kind of the battlefield the way it is today. Ken? Yeah, uh, Ken Cottrell, uh, CTL. You mentioned that um, in terms of autonomous vehicles, that the freight is probably the area where that technology will, will develop and evolve. Can you say a bit more about that? Do you think, for example, it'll be, you know, dedicated lanes first? Will we have a hybrid model with a driver assistant type model? How do you think it'll evolve over the next 10 years or 20 years? So the way I heard the question there, uh, you were behind somebody, it's, it's uh, by autonomous over the road vehicles? Yes. Is that it? Well, as you know, there's been uh, billions and billions of dollars poured into the um, autonomous vehicle area, Waymo famously from Google, emanating from Google, more recently Too Simple, which is sort of half Chinese, half, half American, Aurora, um, there probably there's one in Pittsburgh whose name escapes me, who's got a different uh, approach. I think the reality is that mapping and sensors are coming down the curve and the processing capabilities are such that over the road highway vehicles can be safely driven. Now we are driving them every day with Aurora and I think we may have one or two with Too Simple every day. There's never been one delay. There's never been one accident. Now they're down in Texas where things are flat and the weather generally good. I don't know that I'd want to drive them on the Merritt Parkway up here, you know, <laughs> and out of New York, things like that. But you can kind of see this, the practicality of this coming. Uh, the truck driving job, a lot of work's been done on this, probably right here in this, on this campus about uh, the the attractiveness of truck uh, driving uh, post deregulation, the real wages of a truck driver today, about half what they were, you know, 40 years ago or before deregulation. So at the very least, I think you'll see, and uh, somebody was giving us there, I was very interested in our, our talk earlier about human factors in trucks. So at the very least, you're gonna, there will be an autopilot in the truck. I mean, where you can sit there and, you know, punch it in and just like in a 777. Our 777 pilots come in Hong Kong to Memphis nonstop. They fly the plane about two minutes. You know, they like to take it off. You know? <laughs> and then they, 
punch a little button, and then they just move a little wheel. The reality is they could be hands-free and the plane can land, taxi it to the gate, and shut itself off if, if they want, want to punch that button. But a lot of times they like to land it too, but it's not because they have to. So I just think that that's, there's too much e economic benefit, too many sociological pressures uh, to provide the number of drivers that are actually needed for logistics uh, in the country. So we're optimistic about that. I'm not optimistic about any point to any other point, personal transportation being autonomous. I think what you'll have is closed circuits. You know, downtown San Francisco, here in Boston Commons, maybe you can get a, you know, an autonomous taxi. But I think the uh, just the the sheer magnitude of all the processing and machine learning you have to go through to know that, you know, Professor Steffi lives over here and his dog runs out here every day. That's tough. But on the highway, everything's marked the same. I think it's coming. Probably without drivers, if I had to guess, 27. Another, probably another three or four years, but it, it's really coming along. You had a question there. there was a... mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Fabricio. I'm from Brazil, and thank you for word, your words about Brazil. I agree 100%. And if you are here celebrating 50 years of innovation in supply chain, Brazil can say that we are also 50 years being the country of the future. And my question for you and for you both is very simple. I've been working with supply chain for the last 10 years in industries, and I've been studying with MITx at my country and having access to a lot of important knowledge about supply chain, but it's been really hard for a lot of people to transfer the knowledge from good courses like Josue is doing with supply chain, uh, sustainability, and it's been really hard for us to move the knowledge from the universities and make impactful changes in our companies. Mm -hmm. What advice can you both give us as supply chain professionals, which we didn't have 50 years ago, so we can have more success applying these tools in our business? Mm. Well, it's a good question. Again, you also heard, uh, heard me say how much I love Brazil. I like Brazil. We've got a big uh, operation there for, by the way, for those who you don't know it, it was Brazil that invented the airplane, not the Wright brothers. And they have an airport uh, to prove it. It's Santo Domas Airport. And I personally went down there years ago to Embraer when it was very nascent and uh, flew a Bondurante into Santo Domas Airport and got educated very quick on it. It was the Brazilians that invented, <laughs> that invented the plane, not the Americans. <clears throat> so don't make the mistake, go down there and brag about the Wright brothers because you'll get into a fight. <laughs> now, let me also say that people don't really recognize this, but Brazil and the aerospace ecosphere around Embraer, it is world class. They have the finest engineers. They, they, it's just world class. So I, I guess I would have to answer it this way. <clears throat> You can't take a fish out of the sea. And by that, I mean you have to have an environment which allows you to, to do things efficiently and change. And if you don't, you can have all the good intentions in the world. So I was heavily involved as a much younger man in the late 70s in the deregulation of air cargo, air passengers, interstate trucking and rail, and then eventually intrastate trucking in 1994 and putting in open skies. The removal of the friction of the regulation of trucking is what led to Walmart, Target, the big box retailers. Absent that, now it was bad for the truck drivers and the truck load industry evolved, Swift, MS carriers, uh, all of them think without that, you could never have the efficient retail sector that we have today. So one of the biggest problems that you have in Brazil, if anybody's spending time down there, the states are very powerful. And when you cross state lines, 
you have all kinds of, of uh, friction. And the tax code in Brazil is mind-boggling. I mean, you just have all kinds of non-productive things going on. Now, India had the same thing, and they recently changed that. So we'll see. They had the same kind of state taxing and, uh, you know, crossing border issues. And I would say, based on my, not very deep, but, but I think, adequate study of American history, one of the most under-remarked uh, things that made the United States the economic powerhouse it is, is the Commerce Clause, where you couldn't do what they do in Brazil or previously did. And there's a famous case about, you know, I can't call the Supreme Court case about ferry services across the Hudson. Had that gone a different way, we probably would be a fraction because, you know, we'd be causing you a a tariff to come across down to Tennessee and sell us something here from Massachusetts. To me, that's the biggest single thing is in a lot of the developing parts of the world is the friction because of legacy, interest, uh, so forth, to keep things from, from becoming more efficient. One of the biggest reasons that China became the, 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 the economic hegemon that it did is because they were damn ruthless about getting anything out of the way of the growth. I mean, we wanted to move our hub, which at the time it was down in the Philippines, up to China because the whole economic epicenter of, the, of, of Asia was centering on China. So we selected Guangzhou. In Guangzhou, um, there was a village over on the eastern side of the airport and we wanted uh, the hub, the only place to put it was on the eastern side of the airport so it could connect easily with Shenzhen and Hong Kong. So our folks told them that. They said, well, that's what we need. The village was gone in about <laughs> one week. Now, we made sure that they treated the people in terms of compensation and all fairly, but it, it was just unbelievable, you know, how fast they cut through the red tape. To this day, unless I'm badly informed, uh, there are a lot of people that are illegally living on the airport at Mumbai. So when you get the, the, the friction to commerce, which are, which is sort of the writ large supply chains, it's hard to implement innovations and in best in class things. And again, had it not been for deregulation in the United States, this country's GDP would be a fraction of what it is today. And in particular, the retailing sector would be uh, nothing like it is today. Nothing. So these larger issues, I think, are the biggest thing you got to deal with there in, in, the, in the places like Brazil and so forth. You have to first fix Sao Paulo. There are different parts of Sao Paulo that have different tax. Yeah, uh, there you it's, go. It's, it's not only mm -hmm. be between the last question. That was, you had the last question. Thank you. My name is Mark Choklingham. I am a FedEx alum as well. I used to work in Memphis for Raj 20 years ago. So Good to um, see you. Thank you. I remember building international package volume models. So what do you see currently in terms of trends in package volume between Asia and US? The reason why I'm asking is, do you, do you think this recession is a global recession or just a US recession? Well, uh, I mean, obviously, what's going on in Europe, I never thought I'd see in my adult life a kinetic war in, in Europe with tanks and things like that. It, it's just so horrifying. So uh, I believe Europe is outperforming versus dire expectations. Yes. And uh, I think the central part of that is Europe was much more deft or agile in replacing Russian oil and gas than uh, Putin thought that they would be. So there's a, some, as you probably have seen, some, some signs of, of things are better than we thought they were going to be. I think in the United States, we have a couple of really big things that are going on here that, again, are not very well commented on. The most important of which is we've become Europe in that work is now optional. I mean, what Europe 
did in the post-World War II era, particularly in the 80s and 90s, is they disarmed and they used those uh, government uh, funds essentially for social services. We've not had that in the United States. Uh, we started creeping up on it in the mid-1990s and then Clinton famously you know, moved to the center and changed a lot of the welfare criteria and so forth. But over the last, um, you know, in this century, uh, many of our entitlement programs now require no work uh, at all. And there is a very, very insightful book by Phil Graham and two other world-class economists called The Myth of, Mer of American Inequality. And what it shows is if you take the American uh, economy, the population by uh, quintiles, and remove taxes paid from the top fifth, and you take government transfers down on the bottom, bottom fifth, the inequality is much less than people talk about it because the news and the government, the statistics, they don't do those two things. It's just if you make $18,000 flipping hamburgers, that's your income. It doesn't take in the transfer payments you get for your total, total income. So with the American Recovery Plan of March 2021, and during the pandemic, many, many programs, particularly food stamps, have now become no criteria whatsoever. I mean, hell, I might, you know, qualify for food stamps. I've never tried, but maybe I'll look into it. But, <laughs> but all kidding aside, you understand what I mean. You've got um, the par farmers and agriculture for it. You've got the folks that believe in universal basic income and that sort of thing. By the way, the two most uh, quoted uh, right-wing economists of the 20th century, Hayek and Milton Friedman, both agreed that you should have some sort of negative income tax. They didn't call it that, I mean, uh, they, uh, universal basic income. But it had to be based on work, but, and Milton Friedman's approach was a negative income tax, which is kind of what we have today with the child, or refundable child credits and so forth. So our problem with inflation today and running an economy, a lot of the problems is simply we can't grow any faster because we don't have the blue collar labor that's willing to work. And the second thing I would commend to you is Nick Eberstadt's work. He's uh, one of the great demographers. He was with American Enterprise Institute. He wrote a book called Men Without Work. And he recently updated it. And now the, the updated version is called Work Without Men. But what he shows is there are millions and millions and millions of prime age working males in the United States that don't work between the ages of 20 and, and 55. And what they're doing, and it's in his book, it's very scholarly and, and kind of, they're, they're at home on screens. Now what the hell they're looking at, I don't know, but, but playing games, well, they don't work. And uh, so, I think the recession that we have is a reset of the pandemic uh, payments and it's hard for us to get out of it because Europe is not robust. China's had these lockdowns and the recalibration of people on their supply chains. And then the United States has become, over the last few years, a social democracy but hadn't really recognized it. And on top of that, we want to be the world's policeman. That's hard to do. So you got, again, like we were talking about, these, you can't just take supply chains and business and the economy out from the macro policies. And the policies have done those things. And particularly now with, with Ukraine, I mean, we're, we're, I mean, people can use all kinds of euphemism. We're, we're in a war with the damn Russians, NATO is. We just don't have our NATO soldiers there. But putting these tanks is a profound move. Just happened yesterday, I believe. So I think that's what's going on. I, I, it's hard for us to get a real handle on it, but it's strictly, it's definitely had a very negative effect on world trade and on, on demand, uh, particularly uh, out of China and across the Pacific. Okay, guys. Thank you very much. We're not going to take any more questions. Okay. Good to see you. Appreciate okay. It. Glad to do it.